Hello. In this lesson, we will continue our discussion of the forces that change the surface of the surface of the Earth, that transform the surface of the Earth that we talked about in the past two lessons. And this lesson, we will mainly concentrate on the erosional forces. Now. We start with a discussion on the origin of mountains. Now, in the last two lessons, we talked about how mountains are, are formed. Is that right? When the two plates begin to meet each other and then they, they could buckle, continental and continental plates meeting each other will buckle, forming mountains. And valleys and mountains are formed by falling of rocks, falling of rocks, and all these are natural forces that form mountains. But erosional forces are the ones that give them shape and categorize them into different groups. So let's talk about the origin of mountains. Mountains are produced by the forces in the earth that cause parts of the earth crust to rise while the others to sink. Is that right? We talk about the faults that produces sinking and rising. We talked about the continental, continental plates meeting, providing the uplift. All these are forces in nature that creates mountain ranges and valleys. Uplift of crust combined with chemical and physical erosion of air, water and ice over millions of years produced the spectacular scenery that we found in our mountains. So the raw mountains that are created by the force of nature are refined by these erosional forces. Now what are, what are the erosional forces that contribute in there? The motion of air that we call wind, the motion of water, and the motion of great big pieces of ice. All these things will cause the erosional forces. Now, mountains can be classified into four types. They're called volcanic mountains, fault block mountains, complex mountains, and erosional mountains. We will look at each of them as we move on. Volcanoes are built up by liquid and solid rock erupting from the interior of the earth. We talked about that. As the interior of the earth erupt, they bring out materials and these materials gradually pile up in a heap, in a mountain. So here you have a volcanic mountain. The mountain of a volcano is formed by ejected materials that is deposited in a conical shape. The crater of a volcano, you can see the crater of the volcano here, is a basin-like depression over a vent. The vent is where the, the lava comes out. Now here I have uh, the schematic diagram of a volcano. This is the vent where the, the uh, lava comes out. That's a crater where it actually comes out on the surface. And we call this the pipe. Well, that is the path that the lava takes to come up. Now, this is the magma chamber. This is where the interior of the earth melts into liquid due to excessive heat. So this is the melted rock, the magma chamber and the magma therefore forces out when it finds a crevice between the faults in the rock and there the cone is getting built up. Here is the cone that is getting built up and with time the cone will grow it into a mountain. So a volcano constitute a vent, now here is the vent, a pipe, a crater and finally a cone and you can see the the lava really spewing out 
and forming that mountain, that cone-shaped life structure. A volcano forms when magma breaks out at the surface. Only a small fraction of the magma actually reach the surface. Again, we talked about it in a previous lesson. A large part of it will stay underground, solidify, and become rock underground. Most of it remains below ground, cooling and solidifying, and such igneous rocks, but of course, solidified lava is the igneous rock, and such a rock is called a batholith. A batholith is a rock that is formed underground. A batholith become exposed at the surface through erosion. So this rock that is formed underground with time when the soil is eroded out, the rock will become visible. Now this kind of rocks are rather common around here. The intrusion of a batholith, that is the intrusion is as it juts out of the earth's surface. Sometimes tilt rock lays upward forming what is called a hawkback, a ridge with equal slopes on sides. Have you seen mountains like that? Look at this. This is a good example of a batholith. There are equal slopes on both sides. Now, erosional mountains are formed by erosion of the uplift. The uplifted part of the mountains gradually is tiled or fashioned by erosional forces like the Black Hills in western South Dakota and extensive plateaus like the Appalachian Plateau in the eastern United States. When masses of almost vertical layers are eroded, you can actually see that in this picture. Now, layers of very hard rock may remain as an erosional remnant. A, a lot of uh, soft part like soil and other remnants will be washed away by wind and rain leaving a solid rock part. So layers of very hard dense rock will be left behind and that is a good example of an erosional mountain. Now here is another example of an erosional mountain. Look at the beauty of that. When a long ridge of mountain is composed of almost vertical layers, these layers may be eroded by wind and rain into jagged ridge. You can see they look like steps. You can actually climb all the way to the top using those steps. So, eroded into jagged ridge resembling the blade of a saw. All these are caused by the erosional forces in nature. Now look at this mountain range. These are called fault block mountains. Can you tell me what kind of mountain ranges are these? Actually, the mountain ranges in the Himalayas are the fault range mountains. The mountains that are formed by a land plate coming in contact with the land plate where one gets uplifted is actually fault block mountains. So fault block mountains are formed by the movements of crustal block along faults form, formed when tensional forces pull apart the crust, some of which will move upward while some others will move downward. You see, the Eurasian plate is riding over the Indian plate has created the Himalayas. So this is the Mount Everest and the Swiss Alps are actually examples of this type of mountains. Swiss Alps is another example of fault block mountains. Complex mountains. When you cannot classify a mountain into erosional mountains or fault block mountains or volcanic mountains, well, it defies classification we call it complex mountains. Now they may have a combination of upfalls and downfalls resulting in a very complex structure. Now these mountain forms are common in the Jasper National Park. Now here I have a picture of a complex mountain. This is the Jasper National Park mountains. 
they do not come into any of the volcanic or uh, erosional or fault block type. Now, what are the processes that tear down the surface? You see, the surface of the earth is torn down and rebuilt over and over again. What are the processes that tear down the surface? The first one is weathering. So let's look at some of the weathering processes. What are these weathering processes? Weathering is the breakdown and alteration of the rocks and minerals at or near the Earth's surface. Now, weathering is the first step for a number of other biochemical and geomorphic processes that change the surface of the Earth. Many types of sedimentary rocks are composed of particles that have been weathered, eroded, transported, and terminally deposited on basins where they sit for millions of years forming sedimentary rocks. You see, that is the result of erosion. Weathering also contributes to the formation of soil by providing mineral particles like sand, silt, and clay. If weathering did not occur, I don't think human civilization would have, would have been able to survive on this planet. Is that right? We depend most of our life on what the soil gives us. So, how does the soil form? Soil forms as a result of weathering. Well, elements and compounds extracted from the rocks and minerals by weathering process supply nutrients to plants. So all the plant life and animal lives actually depend on the nutrients that are broken down from the, from the rocks. Oceans are saline as a result of the release of salt from rock and minerals on the continents. So the salt and minerals that are released from rocks are carried away by running water and finally deposited in the sea, causing the salinity of seawater. You can see, look at the implications of erosion. There are three broad categories of mechanisms for weathering. So let's look briefly at these. There is physical weathering, chemical weathering, and biological weathering. We will now look at each of these briefly. What is physical weathering? Well, physical weathering is the breakage is actually caused by, what I'm doing is actually physical weathering of this material. Physical weathering is the breakdown of minerals or rock material by entirely mechanical methods. What are mechanical methods? What I just did is actually a mechanical method. Something hitting something else is a mechanical or physical breakdown. So, the processes that may cause mechanical rupture are, I have some names in here, abrasion, abrasion is the rubbing of things together, crystallization, thermal insulation, wetting and drying, and pressure release. These are all some of the technical terms used in describing physical weathering. Let's look at each of those. Abrasion occurs when some force causes two rock surfaces to come together, causing mechanical weathering, rub each other, causing mechanical weathering. What is crystallization? Crystallization can cause the necessary stresses needed for the mechanical rupturing of rocks and minerals. And what is wetting and drying? Wetting and drying is the accumulation of successive layers of water molecules between the mineral grains of a rock causing tensional stresses. Particularly when water gets accumulated between layers, water, when, you know when it is cooled down or when ice forms, it expands. And that causes physical weathering. Well, how about pressure release? Uh, we, we talked about the hawkback rock. What is the hawkback rock? A rock that has been brought on surface 
by means of weathering when the solid soil particles are washed away a rock surfaces you see this rock has been sitting underground for a long time subjected to great pressure when that pressure is removed the rock will begin to rupture that's called the pressure release you see if you bring a fish from way under the ocean where the pressure is very high suddenly to the surface the fish will break into pieces because that fish is meant to withstand great pressures at the at the bottom of the ocean when suddenly that pressure is unloaded the fish breaks into pieces in the same way a rock buried underground for a long time is used to great pressure when that pressure is unloaded when the pressure is removed the rock begin to break and that is what we call the pressure release when erosion bring igneous rocks to the surface the decrease in pressure caused the rock to break apart now here i have examples of some physical weathering this is the breaking apart of rocks and minerals due to physical processes this is the uh, tulsa slope lost river west virginia west virginia has some beautiful places of geological beauty if you drive down on one of the roads that leads to uh, well i once drove down to pittsburgh from through that area beautiful areas where all these geological changes that i'm talking about is visible there some examples of physical weathering around the country now this is another process of physical weathering where rock particles are broken into pieces these are shale chips again in west virginia there are a lot of choices out there if you go now look at the breaking up of the surface of this road now some mountain this is the stone mountain in georgia an example of physical weathering now you can see eventually all these will be broken into bits carried away by wind and rain and ultimately will become part of a sedimentary rock now this is an example of a hot back see look at that rock once it was underground and when erosion removed all the soil it just surfaced and the pressure release has resulted in the breaking of this rock in several places so this is an example of unloading what is unloading unloading means the surface the soil and everything has been removed that means the pressure has been released and the rock then begins to break all right we talked about physical weathering what is the process of chemical weathering chemical weathering involves the alteration of the chemicals and the mineralogical composition of the weathered material in fact the rock material will undergo chemical changes and gradually break down the most common chemical weathering process are look at this hydrolysis oxidation reduction hydration carbonation and solution these are some of the chemical weathering processes what is hydrolysis hydrolysis involves the reaction between mineral ions and ions of water hydro is water so the reaction between mineral ions and ions of water forming new compounds as a result of forming the new compounds the rock will begin to break down just like iron when it rusts haven't you seen iron breaking down because of rust that's the same process oxidation is the reaction that occurs between compounds and oxygen resulting in the removal of one or more electrons from the compound which causes the structure to be less rigid and therefore increasingly unstable to become easy for breaking in fact rusting of iron is oxidation oxidation reduces the strength of the material which therefore result in breaking 
oxidation of rocks results in the decrease in the strength that will cause the breakage of the rocks. What is reduction? Reduction is actually the reverse process of oxidation. Hydration allows for the acceleration of decompositional reactions by expanding the crystal lattice, offering more surface area for reaction. That means it is the process of reacting the crystals reacting with water. So when water crystallizes or when water freezes, it expands and makes the crystal lattice bigger and making the surface area for reaction greater. And carbonation is the reaction of carbonate and bicarbonate ions with minerals. Now you don't need to worry much of these processes in detail, but just to know that these are very many forms of weathering that takes place in the, on the surface of the earth. Now, here are some examples of weathering. Look at what has happened to these rocks as a result of weathering. Rocks have been systematically eaten away, has been broken systematically and carried away, creating these beautiful shapes. Examples of rocks getting eaten away by chemical processes. And this is the beautiful statue once made of rock and look at the state now. Now it has been eaten away systematically by chemical weathering. Now here is an example of oxidation. Look at the color change of this rock. This is just like rusting of iron. Oxidation, color change, and this rock eventually will become weak and will break down very easily. Another example. Now, this is actually feldspar alters in the clay due to weathering, due to chemical weathering. The clay produced by the chemical weathering of feldspar. And another example of chemical weathering, iron-bearing silicates weather to form clays by hydrolysis. You see, by collecting water between crystal lattices and finally breaking down, this is a good example of hydrolysis of iron-bearing silicate minerals. And all these are very common in many parts of America. Especially, as I told you, if you go down to West Virginia, all these kind of scenes are very, very common. Okay, we talked about physical weathering, chemical weathering, and now we talk about biological weathering. What is that? How does biology help weathering? Well, Biological weathering involves the disintegration of rock and minerals due to chemical and or physical agents of an organism. Have you seen plants growing on rock? Well, I'll show you some pictures. The types of organisms that can cause weathering range from bacteria to plants to animals. All these life forms can actually break rocks because they want to dig deep down into the rock. Now look at an example of biological weathering. Here, this is a big piece of rock and here is a big tree growing just in the middle of it. That means the rock, the, the root system of this will be systematically breaking down this rock and eventually it has created a big basin where the tree is standing. That means the rock has been broken and carried away by erosional forces. You see that? How? And eventually, if this tree survives, a lot of this rock will break down into small pieces. And uh, what is this? Lichen on boulder in Cartersville, Georgia, another beautiful area where you can see organisms growing on rock surfaces cause the rock surfaces to break down. Another closer look at that lichen. 
in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Now, they look very harmless, is that right? But hundreds of years of growth like this will gradually eat away, will gradually make the rock into small bits and results in the, in the breaking down of the rocks. So these examples show how rocks get broken and eroded by plant growth. So biological uh, erosion is something that happens all over, all around us. Ah, now, look at this beautiful picture. A great big flock. How did that tree come in through that, uh, that rock? How did it come to live there? The great big tree had been living there, I think, for about 200 years. And it broke that big rock into so many pieces. Tree roots in rock. All right, now we talked so far about weathering. And weathering, we divide into three parts. And weathering breaks down the surface of the earth. Now, once the surface of the earth is broken down by weathering, it is erosion that carries away the broken parts and deposits into some other areas. So erosion, you can see a good example of how erosion occurs. Water comes in and carries away. When there is a hurricane, you can see water comes on the shore and takes away, eats away a part of the beach. That is beach erosion. Very common in Charlotte and Inglewood areas. And every time after a hurricane, the the municipal government or the, the county government has to spend lots of money to bring sand and fill up the place. Well, erosion is a, is, a, is a force that changes the shape of the earth. Erosion happens when running water, sea waves, wind or glaciers. What's a glacier? A glacier is a moving piece of ice. A great big mountain of ice moving is a glacier. And pick up broken materials. You see the broken materials, broken due to all these weathering processes we talked about, is picked up and deposited in other locations. That is what erosion does. Weathering has produced the materials that erosion will carry away. Well, look at a good example of erosion. Gravitational pull plays a major role in the process of erosion. We talked about that in the last class. And this is an example of a uh, landslide. And I talked about the landslide we had today. When I say today, it is, I think, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. This is 4th of October, 2007. We had a great big landslide in San Diego where seven homes and the surrounding areas were simply pushed down. Large movement is a massive movement of earth. The erosional forces assisted by gravity. Now this occurrence is referred to as a mass movement. A mass movement of the surface of the earth. Landslide refers to rapid movement of any type of materials from the short slump of a hillside to the side of a whole mountain. Very often a small hill, a side of a hill may break and come down. But some other time huge mountain sides may collapse. They all are classified as landslide. Now, if you are familiar with the mountain ranges or the hillside sides of California, people love the hilly areas in California until their home gets, gets pulled away by landslide. A lot of multi-million homes are lost almost every year to landslides. But look at an example of landslide caused by gravity. What is this? This is a sinkhole. So in another type of mass movement, certain areas of Earth's surface are pulled by gravity and sink below the ground level. 
Actually, uh, we have a sinkhole within a sinkhole here. That's right. This is a sinkhole inside a big sinkhole. And another example of a sinkhole, a street ditch. So you can see a street going up there, and this is a big sinkhole at the center. Running water and flooding is another serious cause for erosion. Now, gravity does a lot of erosional work, but what carries the broken debris to different parts is actually running water and very many times wind. Well, we are familiar with flooding. When flood comes and floods a certain area, it carries with it a lot of debris, it carries away a lot of materials with it. It is normal for river levels to fluctuate throughout the year and streams bring water and eroded materials into rivers. Now, here this is a river plain. The flood plain of a river is the area around a river that experiences flooding while water levels are high. You see, during the rainy season, very often the water level in the river rises and it floods the nearby areas. Flooding brings nutrients to the flood plain because all the nutrients that have been washed away and deposited at the riverbeds gets carried and, and taken out to the plain surrounding it due to the flooding. That means flooding is actually very good for agricultural crops because the land becomes or land gets more nutritious uh, materials that are carried away by this flood. So flooding brings nutrients to the flood plain because rivers carry rich sediments and materials that serve as fertilizer. So all these processes you can see also assist us in making comfortable living. Now look what erosion has done to this land. Moving streams of water carry away dissolved materials and sediments as they slowly erode the land. While some land may benefit because of erosional deposits, some other land will suffer because materials have been carried away, systematically removed, making that land almost worthless. That's right. This is a floodplain along Rinches River in South Carolina. Soil loss due to water erosion reduces crop yield. Can you think of anything growing on this soil? Notice, most of the soil, the top soil has been washed away. So what remains is not fertile. Nothing will grow on that soil. Let's now look at different types of water erosion. Well, look at this. What is this? Water falling on the rock can actually break rocks into pieces. Can you believe that? This is a great big drop of water. That's beautiful, is that right? It looks like a crown. But the force of that water falling on the rock can actually break rocks into small bits. So rain splash erosion is caused by the impact of water striking the surface. You see, when rain falls on your roof, part of your roof gets broken and gets carried away. If you live in a shingled roof home, look outside on the yard. You can actually see small pieces of the shingle roof being eroded and carried away. What is sheet erosion? Now, those who are familiar with farm understands all these terms. Sheet erosion is caused by the unconfined flow of water running across the surface. You see, if you are a good farmer, you will make sure that the path of water is deviated and you allow water to flow only in certain path. Now, if water is unconfined like this and allowed to flow on a field, 
it produced a sheet erosion. Look at this. Water is running down the length of a field. It carries away a lot of topsoil. Now, this is sheet erosion. This water in here has a lot of debris that is collected from the upside as the water is coming down. Another kind of water erosion is called rill erosion. Again, farmers understand it well. What is rill erosion? Rill erosion is caused by water concentrating into innumerable closely spaced small channels. Look at uh, an example of a rill erosion. I'm sure you have seen this in your yard. Sometimes it happens. Now, another kind of erosion is gullies erosion. Now, gullies erosion is actually when many many real erosions which we saw in your previous slide when many of them occur side by side they will all combine to form a gully and that is the gully's erosion look at this this is the result of many many real erosions combining joining together to form a big gully it's called the gully's erosion well isn't that beautiful and is that an example of erosion? Well, if you want to really see the spectacular results of erosion, where do you want to go? Well, you want to go to Colorado. Is that right? Well, there are great examples of natural erosion in there. Powerful force of running water shape the landscape. Now, the Colorado River for thousands of years have been cutting and carving its path and constructing the great canyon we call the Grand Canyon. Is that right? If you have seen it, you will appreciate the strength and the power of erosion. If one river can trace out, can carve out a, a canyon as deep as 4,000 feet, it's a very, very impressive site. You must go and have a look at it. Now, look at this. This is Utah's Reflection Canyon. And this is carved out by the flow of water. Now, we will not expect water having such tremendous force to do these kind of things. Can it chisel out the rock? Yes, look at the beautiful patterns. The rock has been chiseled out to create these beautiful patterns. And this is another canyon called the Glen Canyon in Utah. And I think after seeing this picture, I think most of you would want to visit that place. You see, for all you know, this has been probably a very flat area very long time ago. And you can see a river or a stream flowing. You can look at the path of that uh, river. It's been carving out and cutting out and chiseling and polishing and carrying away materials, cutting out. Now, can humans do that? Now, how many years will it take for us to do something like this? Look what nature can do. And look at the force of nature. Don't you think it is marvelous? We look at this and marvel. Is that right? Nature's forces are tremendous. We, we are very often helpless at the forces of nature. Beautiful water erosion structures. What is glacier erosion? I told you what a glacier is. A glacier is a big moving mountain of ice. And if a big moving mountain of ice comes in, nothing can stay in its path. It will carry, it will knock down and carry everything in its path. So look at the motion of a great big mass of ice. Once it finishes its journey, it will carve out a new landscape altogether. It will change the existing landscape forever. Look at the changing landscape of the earth due to the forces of nature. So glaciers are commonly visualized as massive engines of destruction. 
they are much more powerful than a very powerful train. Well, you know that most materials will not survive in front of a train, it will simply carry it away. And a glacier is hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than that. It is a massive engine of destruction bulldozing their way down the mountains, tearing off pieces of pieces of what? Resisting rock. If there are rock pieces jutting out in their way, resisting to move, they will simply carry the resisting rock with it. Now, inexorably moving all that they encounter, nothing can stop them. The power of a moving glacier is so much, it will simply take away everything in its path, carving out an entirely new landscape. The valley glaciers are able to erode the land because they pick up and carry debris that moves across the land along with ice. Now here, this is actually once it has been, once a great big massive ice has gone through, what you see is what remains. Glacial erosion is a huge cause of change in the land and is one of the main forces of nature. In fact, most of the surface features have been uh, fashioned by glacial erosion rather than by wind erosion or water erosion. Glaciation is continuously at work, eroding the landscape in Alaska and many mountainous regions today. It is something that continues even today. All right, so we talked about many types of erosion. We talked about, <clears throat> we talked about weathering, and now many types of erosion. Erosion by water, is that right? And now let's talk about erosion by wind. How does wind carry debris and deposit in different parts? Like running water and moving glaciers, Wind also plays a great part in shaping the surface of the earth. It can erode, it can transport and deposit materials. So wind can break rocks, wind can carry the broken pieces and deposit in other places. Wind erosion occurs in two ways and they are called abrasion and deflation. Well, this is an example of actually abrasion. Abrasion occurs when the particles carried along by the wind break, break off small particles. See, look at that. The particles carried by the wind breaks into small particles and polish what they strike. You see, when one particle hits another particle, small Part of it breaks away and then polishes. So that is abrasion. We talked about abrasion. Abrasion is actually contact, rubbing each other. All right, look at an example of wind erosion. Deflation meaning to blow away. So if there is a very dry land, there will be a lot of loose soil and a great big wind blows, everything gets blown away. I'm sure most of you must have experienced it sometime or the other. A great big dust storm. That is an example of a deflation. So a deflation means blow away. The wind picking up on loose materials and taking it away. And here is an example of an eroding field. Now, during the 1930s, I'm sure most of you have heard about this, several years of drought killed the native vegetation in the Plain States. During that period, the, there was increased farming activity. So, what happened? Uh, the many years of drought killed the native vegetation in the Plain States during a period of increased farming activity. So if a land is under farming for a very long time, it is subject to this wind erosion. 
it will lose a lot of topsoil. Now, strong winds eroded the unprotected surface, removing and transporting hundreds of millions of tons of soil. And uh, if you know a little bit of history, this was called the Great Dust Bowl episode. It actually happened in the 1930s, during the time of the Great Depression. You can see a country under a Great Depression as now to put up with the great dust ball episode. A great big wind carrying away millions of tons of topsoil, making the land virtually not fit for cultivation. Here is another example of erosion. Now, eroding soil covers the road and fills the shoulder. I'm sure these areas, you don't see these kind of things very many times in America. I've lived uh, in Africa, I have seen a lot of this in many African countries. And look at, if you haven't seen one like this, what is this? This is a great big dust storm and very common in the Middle East and Africa. Now I lived in West Africa for some time and I witnessed a number of these great big sandstorms. Once it finishes, you have two inch thick dust in your home. You got to hose down the entire house before you can enter there. Well, another example of wind erosion is the formation of sand dunes and the formation of what's called the loss. So most common sand blown deposits are sand dunes and loss. Let's have a look at these. What are sand dunes? Have you seen them? Where do, the, where do the sand dunes generally occur? Well, a dune is a low mound or ridge of sand that forms when wind encounters an obstacle and that reduces its speed. So this is a sand dune that is in Morocco, in the Moroccan desert. Well, desert areas are the most convenient places where sand dunes are formed. They are formed on beaches, actually. Now, this creates a windbreak. When wind encounters an obstacle that reduces their speed, so that creates a windbreak which results in the formation of the sand dune. Dunes are commonly found in semi-arid areas that is mainly in the desert areas. You see a lot of them in North Africa, a lot of them in the Middle East and so on. And also near beaches. Now here is a good picture of sand dunes. Sand dunes in Namibia. Well, Namibia is in south, uh, near the southern African border. Another beautiful picture of sand dunes, it's another, I have a number of pictures of these beautiful sand dunes, how wind actually fashions the sand and carries away and breaks and carries away part of it. What is a loss? L-O-E-S-S. -S. A loss is a geologic term that refers to deposits of silt that have been laid down by wind action. You see, that massive windstorm that you saw a couple of slides ago, such a windstorm is going to carry a large amount of dust and debris. And where is it going to deposit? Well, when the wind slows down, all that debris is going to fall down and is going to be deficited. So, loss is a geologic term that refers to the deposits of silt that have been laid down by wind. Now, the winter winds would pick up the rock flower dry areas and carry it long distances in huge storms. And when the wind slows down, the silt would fall out and blanket the area. And uh, this kind of building can happen from year after year, building great big mounds like this. Now look at this. This is a typical loss, which is built 
year after year of deposit of debris from wind. Something that never existed long time ago. It is built by wind depositing its material, its load, down there. Now, frequently, the resulting loss deposits are several meters thick. All right, here, an example of another loss. You can see a geology student is actually studying it. Is that right? Well, we saw great many examples of the natural forces that shape the surface of our Earth. You see, we had a good look at our Earth. We looked at the rocks and minerals that form the crust. We looked at the crustal plates, the plate tectonics, and how the plates get carried by the mantle below it, and how the earthquakes and volcanoes are formed, and how all these forces shape and reshape the Earth, how the cycle of changes continues, and I hope by now you understand the meaning is that Earth is a dynamic body. Nothing stays static. Everything is changing, including us. Is that right? We are not static. We, the human beings, or life on Earth, are changing. You see, the life as we see now will flourish for some years. It will die down something new will happen. This is the process of nature. I hope you appreciate that. Well, we've got one more section to go. In this section, we concentrated mainly on the transformations, what happens to the earth, interior and exterior, the dynamic nature of the earth. In the next section, we're going to look at mainly weather patterns on the surface of the earth. That again will shape and reshape the earth and make life possible for us. Is that right? It's the weather patterns that makes it possible for us to live. Well, I will see you for that later on. And in the meantime, I'm sure you are now ready for a third test. So remember, before you go for a test, always look through all the homeworks. I have given you the complete solutions for the homework. And remember, you need to send me the assignments regularly. If you haven't been, well, think about it. Your grade is calculated based on all these participation. All right. Uh, take your test three, and I'll see you for unit four later on. So this.